see how it looks underneath. There's a shot of the underneath. side of the van now. I'll show you how this came out. Come out of the dosing pump on the driver's side. And that's because I spent about an hour under here before I did the install trying to figure out looking at the various pieces of fuel line and connectors that I had that came with the kit and where they would work and where I could mount things where they wouldn't be in the way of batteries and other things that I planned them out under here later. So this is what I came up with. So there's a connector under here. Sprinters come from the factory with a quick release auxiliary fuel connection. So I used one of these, a Dorman Quick Connect. It's like part 800 188. And that connects right up to the Sprinter auxiliary fuel tap that's underneath a piece of heat tubing. And I didn't cover it because it gets hot here. I covered it just so um, the wire, so that the hose doesn't chafe on something else. So I went from that dormant connector to a um, section of hose, and then underneath this wire loom is thicker black tubing, this stuff that came with the S bar kit. So that goes into the intake of the dosing pump. This is supposed to be mounted at an angle that's at least 15 degrees up with the electrical connection pointing up. So then I went into another piece of adapter to zinc tubing and then it goes to the smaller clear plastic tubing that came with the S-Bar kit. So that runs from the pump, goes up and over the fuel tank and again it's in it's in wiring loom that's just to protect it but that is fuel line inside there and there's a factory nut that's welded to the bottom of the frame and I just put a bolt with some washers under there and it's not super tight it's not crushing the fuel line but that's just to prevent the fuel line from having a chance of sagging and landing on the drive shaft. And then here's where it passes over the selective catalyst reduction, which gets really hot. So that's when it moves into that heat protected tubing. It passes over catalyst reduction and then I utilized another factory nut and put a bolt in it again, just to hold the the fuel line up and then goes into the frame wall rail and there's the bottom of the S-bar. So 
this is the intake and it goes up and over a cross member and it's backed behind the splash guard so when it's wet or you're driving on on wet roads I don't think there's any possibility of water getting up in there so that's the combustion air for the heater and then this is the exhaust so there's the little muffler it goes out the side here so I used all of the exhaust piping that was sent with the kit and for the system to be a little quieter you want more piping behind the muffler than before it so in order to do that I almost had to mount the muffler in this location it's fine it probably looks like it's hanging down lower than it really is but I'll show you that in a minute um, I had considered buying more of this exhaust tubing and plumbing it out the back but I did read that S-Bar recommends especially if you use a muffler that the S-Bar wants a certain back pressure and if you extend the hose very much, you can have you can have trouble. So I don't know. We'll see how this goes. I could always extend the pipe later if I decide to, but for right now, I'm going to leave it. So when you're on the driver's side, you can see that none of that is hanging down. So that's how it looks underneath. This is for my project for today to deal with this. So this is all the wiring. This is the head unit. Came with my kit, the thermostat. There's a bag of assorted electrical parts. And this is a high altitude compensation sensor. And since these are S-bar heaters are usually used in boats at sea level, this measures the altitude and um, figures out Basically, it just reduces the fuel through the dosing pump into the S-bar so that it's got the right air-fuel ratio and it's not running too rich, which eventually will will coke up the unit with diesel fuel. So it's a way to make it run a little longer before I have to get in there and rebuild it. So this is the wiring harness. It looks a little intimidating at first. That connects to the heater, and it basically branches three times. This one has your connections to the battery. This one has a bunch of wires that go to the thermostat. But if you're not using the Digimax, if you're using the newer digital thermostats like what I have, it only uses three, uh, four if you count the illumination wire, but it only uses three of those for the head unit, whereas the old analog thermostats use a lot more. And then the third wire is just a two-wire harness that goes to the dosing pump. So I will be working on this today. All right, so I have the heater up and running now. I didn't record it because I spent an entire day doing just the wiring. So your results might vary, but um, it took me a while. So there was no good way to condense all that. You'd be sitting here watching video all day. so. I'm going to spare you that part and just show you the final product. So the wiring harness splits three ways. So you saw when it was laying on the garage floor, one goes to the battery connections, one goes to the heater, and the other goes to the control unit. So starting with the battery, this is the S-bar wiring loom. There's some sprinter wiring in here. This is not related to the heater. This was already in here. So this bundle I ran through the this little track in the floor and over to the driver's seat. This sprinter has the optional auxiliary battery under the hood, so it's a dedicated battery, but it's only 100 amp hours, and I know that I'm going to need more than that to run DC refrigerators and all that. So for right now, I have basically a temporary connection to the auxiliary battery. So on a sprinter, you access the auxiliary battery connection right here. So this is my hookup. The rest of these wires are factory. 
So this is my positive lead and this is my ground wire that goes to a factory ground. So again, that's power and ground. These are the fuses here. And then we have one of these connects up to the heater. So there's a fat wiring harness for the heater. And then this one I ran through, there's a little chase right here that goes into the B pillar. And I don't know if this is permanent or not. I know I want the heater mounted on this wall, but right now it goes up above the sliding door and the heater unit is currently temporarily right here. And I also have the high altitude compensation sensor. So the wiring diagrams are, they are not the most straightforward thing that I've ever seen. Get some more light in here. This is what I boiled it down to. I don't know why they don't put labels on these. So I went ahead and labeled on the right is the air pressure sensor, which is that box. And that's optional, as we talked about earlier. And then in the upper left here, the green focus, the green or gray red and the brown white get tied together. So that's what's going on here on the left. And then there's a gray, a blue, a black, and a red white that are not used if you're using the newer digital timers. If you have the older Digimax, I think it uses many more wires. So there are four wires right here that are taped off. So for my application, and you'll want to check wiring diagrams for yours, I only needed these red, yellow, brown, and blue white. So that's what you see here. Again, this is coming from the S-Bar heater. So I've got those four wires. They go into this harness. They go into the altitude sensor. Those same colored wires come back out. And then they go up into the control unit. So there's actually three wires. A, let's see, a red, white, no, I'm sorry, a red, a brown, and a blue-white that go to the head unit. So I hope that clarifies a little bit. I know a lot of people have had trouble figuring out the wiring for the high-altitude sensor, but that's, that's what it boils down to. So it works really well. It puts out a lot more heat than what I was expecting. It's a little quieter than I was expecting. All in all, I'm very pleased. One thing to note is when you're working on, especially in this box, you'll want to have the starting battery ground disconnected. And when you do that, if you have the auxiliary battery package, that system's still going to be live. So you want to disconnect the ground terminal at the auxiliary battery as well. Once you've disconnected both grounds, you should be good for messing around here. So again, not all of this wire is related to the S-Bar. Some of this is airbag wiring and other things, so the wiring is a little bit intimidating, but now that I've done it, I could do it in, in much less time. And in the future, when I do have a larger battery bank, it's probably going to be mounted back near the back of the van. So in the future, I may be running um, wiring from the house batteries up to here, and then I'll disconnect the connection to the auxiliary battery. But then again, I did it well enough that I could leave it this way if I've heard that these really do not draw a lot in the way of power. And so I live in California, depending on what my uses end up being, it may be perfectly fine leaving it hooked to the auxiliary. But that's why you see this wiring harness. I didn't touch it. I left it its original length because if I end up extending wires back to the the rear of the van, I'll end up wanting to use that. So it took a little bit of extra work for me to, to get this set up for 
possibly a different setup in the future. For right now, it's up and running. Thanks for watching. Thank you.